So, hello everybody and welcome back. It's all happening here today at Indie Recon. We hope you're having a good time and um, I am here with Joy from Bubblish. Hello, Joy. Hi. Hi, everyone. So, we have a treat in store for you. Um, Joy is a super presenter and she has a super PowerPoint presentation in her pocket and um, she's going to walk us all through it. Uh, there will be time for questions so please do use the Q&A facility to send in your questions and Joy will address them as we go through the presentation not just as, at the end as is perhaps more usual with our um, Alliance of Independent Authors seminars. So um, yeah, I think over to you, Joy, or over to Mr. PowerPoint. Let's see okay. how we go. Let me share the screen here. And I'm going to switch over to the presentation. Here it comes. And back over to you, Orna. So yeah, what we're going to be talking about is uh, getting sticky and what Joy means by sticky is uh, creating top of mind awareness in your readers. Next slide. So first of all, we can expect that TOMA, T-O-M-A, top of mind awareness is going to be defined for us by Joy. What exactly does she mean by that? I think it's a brilliant um, saying actually, because instantly I get a sense of what you're talking about. And then the steps to make it happen and to achieve long-term TOMA. Are we allowed to say TOMA? Or do we have to spell it out every time? And then <laughs> ideas for creating top of mind awareness with readers and then tools for measuring it. Is that right, Joy? Yeah, next slide. Yeah, so let me tell you just a little bit about a uh, very safe pair of hands that you are in here for this presentation. Joy has more than 20 years now been working as a marketing communicator. She's uh, an award winner and she's as results driven today as she was when she started. Um, and I know that from our communications during this week and, and the great care and attention that she's put into this presentation for you guys. And she's a former international board member for the International Association of Business Communicators. So there is no excuse if you don't understand what Joy says today, it won't be her. So pay close attention and you, you're bound to um, hear something that you, you really do need, need to hear. So over to you, Joy. Thank you so much, Orna. As we go through the session today, you'll see the hashtags Indie Recon and Bublish. And I want to encourage you to tweet relevant ideas and thoughts using those hashtags as we go along. But before we dive in, let's discuss how to create top of mind awareness. Let's take a good running start and define TOMA. So what is it and why do you want to achieve it? According to marketing metrics, TOMA is the first brand that comes to mind when a customer or reader, in our case, is asked to um, an unprompted question about a category. And the percentage of customers for whom a given brand is top of mind, that can be measured. So let's take a quick top of mind awareness test. When I read a category, type your answer into the chat box. For instance, when I say fast food, what do you think of? Go ahead, type your answer into the chat box now. Okay, good. I see literally hundreds of answers scrolling by right now. A lot that I recognize from here in the United States, McDonald's, Wendy's, Burger King, Pizza Hut, KFC. So when I say automobile or car, what brand do you visualize? Type your answer into the chat box now. Wow, there are lots of different cars on the mind out there. I see BMW, Ford, Volvo, Honda. I think you've got the idea. I could play this game with you on virtually any category from apparel to appliances to software and soda. Before we move on, let's do one more. When I say sports team, what's the first thing that you think of? Type your answers into the chat box now.
incredible. Apparently, there's a ton of sports fans on this call. Without playing favorites, I'm seeing the Dallas Cowboys for football, New York Yankees for baseball, Bayern Munich for soccer. I believe this German team recently won their first World Cup, didn't they? So, so no wonder they come to top of mind for some of you. Oh, wait, and the Chicago Bulls for basketball. As you can tell, no matter what the category, you're going to quickly and easily have a brand that comes to mind. Now, it could be that the brand has spent thousands and millions of dollars to make sure that they do come to top of mind. Or it could be that the brand spent very little but worked very hard to make a lasting impression and keep you engaged. Either way, creating top of mind awareness takes planning and work. Let's look at the three different types of top of mind awareness. There's the perennial favorite. You know, everyone has a favorite restaurant, clothing store, hair salon, etc. But the only way to increase your chances of getting in under this condition is to consistently provide great products and customer service to all your customers. If you really plan and work hard for some prospects, you will make the cut and become a perennial favorite. But what about the lingering bad taste category? Have you ever heard the phrase, I don't know what I want, but I sure know what I don't want? Well, this is it. This is a negative top of mind awareness, and it's a list that you want to make sure that you stay off of. Finally, we have the right exposure category. This is your chance for top of mind awareness that's within your control. The more frequently your customer is exposed to your brand, the more likely they are to do business with you or in your case, to buy your books. And as you increase your exposure, you're going to build brand awareness. So how do you get to top of mind awareness in a good way? Well, the first thing I recommend is that you build your brand ramp, R-A-M-P, so that you come to mind when readers desire a book to read from your genre. You can't really predict when that need is going to occur, so you want to position yourself to come to mind when that time of need happens. This means that either the reader will already know about you and think about your books when the need arises, or you'll be recommended by other readers. So how do you do this? Well, build your brand RAMP with this acronym. RAMP stands for Recognize, Articulate, Memorize, and Preference. You see, you want readers to recognize you and your author brand. And you want readers to be able to share with others what you write. Under Memorize, you want to make sure that they are able to easily memorize what you do so it comes to mind at their elusive time of need or, as readers go, their desire for your genre. And finally, the P in RAMP standing for preference, you want readers to prefer your book over others. You need to get on the radar of prospective readers because they can't buy your book if they don't know you exist. That's the R for recognition. And they won't buy if they don't know what you write and how you draw your readers in on an adventure that they won't soon forget. This is the A in Articulate. If you can get readers to memorize what you do and prefer your books over others, you'll continue to win prospective readers when they talk about their favorite books with others. Before we move on, let's take a few questions. Orna? Well, yeah. Um, one that's coming in a few times is around uh, fiction and nonfiction. So uh, questions from, from, I suppose, to sum up the, the different ways this is being asked. Essentially, is it easier for nonfiction writers to do this? I think it's easy for anybody to do it. If you are honed in on what your brand is and you know what you write, you just have to focus on the key steps that we're going over here and you'd be able to pull it off. And what about literary fiction? If you write, um, which a lot of literary fiction writers do, I think this is what this means. Um, you don't necessarily write the same thing each time. Um, how do they go about establishing this awareness? So what I would recommend, and, and actually I just recently gave a webinar on this for Bublish, um, is that you create, you go after two different things. You create a tagline, a talking tagline about yourself as your author brand that tells what you do, right? And then I would recommend 
that you create key messages that you want to have resonate for each book that you write. That way, it still draws back to you, but there's that one central point that talks about who you are as an author. Okay, so if you write lots of different kinds of books, you're saying perhaps you become the brand rather than your books? That's exactly what I would recommend. Okay, interesting. All righty. Um, shall we move on? Sure. So we'll stop for some more questions in a little bit, but let's look at this next slide. How do we create long-term Toma? Well, now that you know what Toma is and that you need to focus on building your brand ramp, let's talk about how. The first thing I recommend is that you target a niche group of readers. In this case, it should be pretty easy because you already focus on a particular genre. Most of you do anyway. And your readers that follow that genre, that's your niche group. You want to design a campaign for that small group. For instance, you may want to target your local Twitter followers or those that follow you on a particular Twitter list. Um, maybe a smaller, more targeted approach feels more personal. And with that, it will engage your readers. The next point is you want to build up brand awareness with regular communication. Use social media by posting frequently and at different times of the day to capture the attention of your target audience. So if you send an email campaign, be sure to establish a cons uh, consistent frequency and format that your readers can depend on. For instance, at Bublish, as the Chief Marketing Officer, I send out a newsletter to Bublish readers the first Tuesday of every month. I call it Bublish's Editor's Choice, and in it, I share the top entrepreneur book bubbles that readers might enjoy. The newsletter's consistent, and readers have come to expect it. So the next point would be seek and share feedback. Readers love to feel appreciated and connect with the authors that they follow. So consider asking your readers for reviews of your books. Collect and share testimonials from happy readers. And when a reader discovers you, they're going to be encouraged to learn that there are other happy readers out there. Now, this last point I want to spend a little bit more time on. I think it's really important to reward frequency and engagement. You see, every author wants and needs regular readers, actually kind of a fan club of readers. So my question to you is this. Why are new readers the ones who typically receive discounts? Mm -hmm. or the promos, right? You know, a lot of people think it's more difficult to bring in a new reader than it is to keep an old one coming back. But I think that all readers, new and old, should be treated and rewarded equally. To do this, I think you need to think through a list of things to give to your readers. So when you're planning, brainstorm. And I'm going to give you some ideas right now. The easiest thing, of course, to give away is your product, your book. But you could also give away books from your other author friends. If you do this, make sure that your author friend is reciprocating and helping you by doing the same thing to their readers. Create a contest and make the winner your brand ambassador. Ask readers what they want. Trust me, you ask, they're going to tell you. And as a prize, you may consider allowing a reader to name a character in your next book. Or how about giving away a 20-minute Skype or Google chat with the author? Maybe you could do a shout-out in your acknowledgement section of your book. Create a web page that's dedicated to your fans and highlight an interview with your fan of the month. That's right, create a fan of the month or maybe even a fan of the year. You could even take it a step further and give them a badge that they could put on their respective Facebook page or website, which is going to further extend your brand. Give away book tchotchkes that you could email to winners. Like maybe if you do children's books or romance genres, you could email them a PDF of paper dolls. Or maybe if you do speculative fiction genres, you could do a detailed world map. Or maybe if you are into historical genres, you could do recipes from that time period. What about an autographed picture of yourself? I know it seems a little vain, but... Don't you remember when you used to, you know, see that that guy that was on the poster in your on your wall in your bedroom and you ran into him at Walt Disney World and you had to get his autograph? Well, 
it doesn't change when we get older. Send your authors an autograph, uh, your authors, your readers an autograph picture of yourself, or maybe an autograph book. The list of ideas that you can come up with doesn't have to cost a lot of money, and the ideas are as long as your creativity and imagination. Whatever you offer, make sure that it's designed to engender loyalty and help you and your books rank higher on your readers' top of mind awareness. So now let's talk about what you don't want to do when you're trying to create top of mind awareness. <sighs> don't be a salesperson. If all you do is sell with your marketing outreach, you'll turn readers off. I've actually seen authors do this. All they do is send out communications, email or socially, that says buy my book over and over and over again. You've probably seen it too. Readers want to know and engage with their favorite authors instead of constantly selling. Use your interactions to be transparent and real. Talk about your love of writing. For instance, if you're a historical fiction author, share what drove you to pick the era that you write about. What do you find fascinating about it? The more you share about yourself transparently, the more readers will probably be able to identify with and relate to you. Now, I'm not saying that you should never sell, but there's a balance that you need to achieve. For example, for every seven communications you send out, consider promoting the sale of your book or books one to two different times. Now, you don't want to sound just like your competitors, you know, like other authors that write the same genre. So take some time to determine what is unique and different about what you write and share that with your readers. If you have a blog, consider writing a post about what makes you unique. Or take a character in your book and write a brief bl blog post from their perspective, such as 10 unknown facts about Lord Barrington. Study your competitors by following them socially and visiting their website. Decide what you do better or differently than them and make that part of your message. Bottom line is this. You're going to attract readers when you give them information that's not found in your books. This also provides an opportunity to connect with readers on a deeper level as they relate to and interact with what you're sharing. Now this next one is actually one of my, my passionate ones. Avoid hide behind, hiding behind your writing. In other words, don't become so focused on writing and producing books that you drop the ball when it comes to marketing your brand and creating top of mind awareness. I know you didn't become an author to spend time marketing and building your brand, but let me ask you this. If you don't do it, who will? Of course, once you build up a loyal following of readers, they will join you and become brand evangelists for everything you write. So how do you build up that loyal fan base? The way to build your brand and connect with readers is to be everywhere that your readers are likely to be found. Build top of mind awareness. Whenever your readers turn around, they need to bump into you. You can do this by following other authors of a general genre, similar genre, commenting on their posts. You know, their fans are going to begin to wonder who you are and want to check you out. And that author that you're following may have a bigger following than you, so you'll start to build up your fan base. Or maybe you could write a guest blog post on that same author's blog or offer to give away their books to your fans and they'll do the same in return. I think you might have heard that before. The key to getting the right attention is to be consistent in whatever you do. You can't be a one-hit wonder. You can't just send out one tweet or email and call it a day. You have to strategically and thoughtfully plan out what and how you'll achieve your goals of connecting with your readers. In fact, you can find more information about how to be consistent and how to plan these goals by listening to a couple of my webinar replays on Publish. Um, I recently talked about the power of consistency with marketing and breaking through the noise with public relations. That's also where you'll find information on how to create that talking tagline. So let's move on over to the fourth and last point on this slide. Don't avoid participating socially. I know what I'm about to say is not profound, but I feel it needs to be said. We live in a social society. You can connect with people from around the globe, just like I'm doing right now, for free, by actively participating in conversations on social media. 
Sadly, I've had the occasion to work with many authors who avoid social media like the plague. They don't understand it, and they don't want to learn how to use it. I have to tell you, this is a surefire way of becoming obsolete in today's social world. To compete nowadays, you must have a web presence, including social marketing sites. But it doesn't stop there. You must actively work the website and social sites to get anything out of them. Are you hearing a theme here? Be consistent. Don't dip your toe in the water. Dive into the deep end and get completely wet. Without ever leaving your workspace, you can network with a wide variety of people. You can make excellent contacts and create wonderful relationships. It's just about participating. I recently had a situation where I was working for a company and helping them enhance their web presence and social networking, and I created a blog and LinkedIn and Facebook pages. Within just a few weeks, I was driving massive traffic between all these different pages and generating interest in what they had to offer, simply because I participated. I joined LinkedIn groups and participated in the conversations. I posted polls and made new contacts. In one of the groups, which had over 2,200 members, within a week, I became one of the top contributors. In another, the editor of a magazine liked one of my posts and wanted to do an article on me. So, make sure you avoid these mistakes. But before we move on, Orna, do we have any questions? Whoa. <laughs> there are so many questions on, on everything that you're talking about there. I know this isn't strictly within the, the remit, but it's just, again, something that just comes up again and again and again and, and is always asked whenever somebody who understands uh, and marketing talks to writers. The first question that, that, that gets raised is, how do I make time for this as well as writing my book? Do you have any tips around that particular challenge? Well, I'll, I'll use myself as an example, and it has absolutely nothing to do with marketing, okay? Mm -hmm. um, I just turned 50 in January. And last, what'd you say? Can we say congratulations? Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you what happened. Um, so last summer, I had just recovered from a, a major foot reconstruction surgery, and I put on a ton of weight. And I saw 50 looming, and I kind of freaked out a little bit, as most of us probably do. And I thought, okay, I have a choice. I can either be flabby and 50, right, or I can be fit and 50. But the way that I'm going to be in one of those places over the other is by making a commitment. So what I did was I joined a gym. And I changed my way of eating, not as a diet, as a lifestyle. And to be successful in both of those ventures, I did these two things. I scheduled it on my calendar. That time scheduled on my calendar to go to the gym, to that particular workout class or training session or whatever, I don't let anything compete with it. And this is a huge change for me. But... I keep that as an appointment because it's going to make me successful in reaching my goals, right? Mm -hmm. And then the other piece is, is I track every piece of food that goes into my mouth, which sounds laborious, but it's been worth it. I've lost over 30 pounds. Now, you're thinking, well, okay, Joy, that's fine, but what does that have to do with I want to write and how do I schedule the time for marketing? Oh, well, that's just the secret right there. You have to be committed. You have to set the goal and you have to schedule it on your calendar. Maybe you start small. You know, one of my favorite uh, sayings is, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? So maybe what you do is you say, I'm going to dedicate one hour a week to the process of marketing. And be successful with that time. Break that time into chunks. Take 20 minutes to do something, 20 minutes to do something else, and 20 minutes to, to do something else. Maybe the first 20 minutes is just for your planning, right? And maybe the next 20 minutes is where you actually reach out to other people that you want to connect with. And maybe another 20 minutes is, is actually doing the research that you need for who should I be connected with. And not necessarily in the order that I just put out there. It's whatever works for you. But if you schedule that time for yourself, you're going and keep that appointment. Don't let anything get in the way. You will find success in that. And then you'll build on it and go, wow, this is pretty good. 
I, I need to add more. It takes 21 days, they say, to create a habit. So, so you got to start somewhere. Anyway. Good. Yeah. And uh, I think often the question about time is really a form of resistance um, in the sense that you don't need a huge amount of time is my experience um, with this sort of thing, but it does need to be sort of every day and it does need to be a creative intention, if you like. And I, I, that's another um, feature of the questions. There's a, a feeling almost that um, marketing is a sort of a crass activity and writing is a super creative activity and ne'er the twain shall meet. I, I know you don't agree. No, I don't. <laughs> in fact, I think that writing and marketing go hand in hand. I mean, if you're going to communicate effectively with people via social media or emails or blog posts, what are you going to be communicating? Things that you write. So it's just a different type of writing. And you spoke about, uh, uh, you know, doing writing that's not, information that's not in the books. Um, could you give some examples, more examples of that? People were saying, what sort of things might you write about? Is it just writing? Would it also be maybe video, audio? Oh, wow. You could, you could do video. Um, you could easily use your um, iPhone or use Skype or Google Hangout and you could actually record an interview with one of your fans. Um, they could give you a book review. You could record an interview with um, somebody that you find as a, a leader in the author space, right, in the writing space. Um, you could also um, take your characters. I gave you that one example that I completely made up about the top ten um, I forget what I said, the top 10 things that Lord Barrington is, yes. <laughs> you know, and so you could take each one of those characters and you could develop their character and their personality even more because especially when a lot of people are writing series these days, I don't know about you guys, but I'm an avid reader and I get really sad when I see a series or a book end and I want to know more. So answer those questions that maybe you didn't answer in the book. Um, there's all kinds of different ways to creatively do it. And by the way, those are creative ideas. So you're still stretching that creative muscle. So it's maybe like a change of approach, a change of mindset as much as anything else. Yes, definitely. We had a big survey here in the UK um, that said only 25% of authors are interested in doing this sort of thing. And that the, the other, you know, the bulk of the other 75% um, are petrified, they're scared. What would you say to them? I would say become a sponge and learn as much as possible. Sitting on a webinar like this, participating in all of the different options that are available to you throughout Indie Recon. And if you didn't catch it the first time, hit replay because one of these, all these webinars and series will be reposted, right? Yeah, it's going to be here uh, for people to, to, to learn and come back to again and again. So it'll be here for some months. And then when we start preparing um, for Indie Recon next year, it will go into the archives. And our archives from the previous two years are there on the website as well. So, yeah, plenty of learning there, certainly. Right. And and the learning can also be through things like if, if you happen to uh, follow Ali which, you know, the Alliance is a great place. I, I go there all the time and read the blog posts and learn all kinds of, of wonderful information. Um, I think that if you're going to be successful at this, you can't just become, you know, stuck in the closet, hide behind your writing. You actually have to be proactive. You know, as an author, if you're going to make money, if it's your business, you have to treat it like one. And professional development is part of that. John says, I did all this and nobody cared. <laughs> well, you have to keep at it. And sometimes what you have to do, John, is you have to actually um, measure what you've done and tweak as you go. So you have to figure out where that success might be. Do you have the right people following you? Do you have the right message that you're sending out? Are you actually sharing things that the people that are following you are interested in? Um, if you don't know what they're interested in, take a poll, survey them, ask them. And that leads back to one other question here, targeting the niche group. How do you do that? Um, 
Christine Nolfi is actually a speaker um, during the Indie Recon Conference, and she's from Charleston, South Carolina, where I am located. And so she does a phenomenal job of having people um, that follow her, and she can tell a lot of times who is local and who's not. So you could actually go into your list and you could put them into a grouping so that you're communicating directly with the people that are local. Um, you could also um, tag people a certain way and just use hashtags so that you're communicating only with the people within a, uh, that follow a particular hashtag. That's just a couple of ideas. Great, you've got so many ideas. Okay, let's hear some more of them. Okay. I love this image, by the way. I do too. We use it <laughs> too. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's so nice. Yeah. It's something I want to frame. It just, it's so warm and inviting. But um, so, how can we ensure that you get your reader love? First, you need your readers to love you. And then you need them to think of you when they are in need of a genre, no matter how far into the future that may be. That being said, you need a long term plan of attack not to just get top of mind, but to stay there. So let's kind of unpack this a little bit. You need to get entrenched for the long term. It's essential that you stay fresh in readers' minds, even when they're not in the market for a new book. If you don't, when the hunger to buy and read a new book arises, they'll quickly go to a competitor. And then you need to ensure that you can be found. If you're least favorite letters of the alphabet are SEO, search engine optimization, then it's time to change your tune. After all, there's no point wasting your time writing books and building a website if nobody knows that you exist. In marketing speak, to ensure you can be found, you need to optimize your website, engage actively in link building, employ keyword strategies, and utilize thought leadership opportunities to establish your brand awareness. If you don't work on search engine optimization, you're not going to see a return on investment of your time as an author. Now, that last part that I just shared is a bit too much marketing speak for you. Know this. You can rely on and use services like Publish, for instance, to send out excerpts of your book that will easily be found. This is because on Publish, um, and I'm speaking about what I know, <laughs> that they we use the metadata to move you through the SEO process. And you don't have to do anything but write engaging book bubbles that, and to have that done for you. So you may wanna check that out if you haven't already. You wanna nurture with thought leadership. Over this time, period of time, you'll have the opportunity to enhance your brand's value and build credibility with readers. Now's not the time to be annoying or vapid with your content. If you're gonna employ a strategy like email marketing, Make sure that the content that you provide is valuable and of interest to your readers. Just like the point I just made to John, you know, survey them and find out what they're interested in. What do they want to learn? What do they want to hear? Don't create that content with yourself in mind. What you find interesting and valuable may be of no use to your readers. Whatever your top of mind plan is, make sure it includes content that bolsters your brand's value. For example, I'm giving this webinar about top of mind awareness in the hopes that you'll find something valuable and you'll remember me and publish. The content is designed to help you and in turn, hopefully to help you think of our company. You can do the same thing with informative tweets and thought provoking posts via LinkedIn or Facebook or your blog that are going to resonate with your readers. And the last thing I want to say here is don't be cute. Be informative. You know, this is not an age of naive naiveness. Readers know you have books to sell, and you want to sell books to them. So don't insult your readers' intelligence by pretending the eventual sale doesn't exist. Instead, buy into what they want, information. If you have a new book, tell them about it, and be sure to explain why you write what you write and why it's different. Don't push the sale. Push why they should read your book, which will convert into a sale eventually. You see, top of mind awareness is accessible to everyone. You just need to get behind your brand, develop a plan, and consistently do it. 
So how do you connect with your readers? Well, I suggest that you start by using social media and following the 70-20-10 rule. What does that mean? Well, 70% of the content information that you share socially should add value to your brand and build recognition. Information that your readers would find valuable and interesting. And 20% should be sharing others' content. So maybe you're retweeting what, what you've seen that Orna has written. Um, and then 10% should be promotional content. That's the selling part. So be intentional and spend time hanging out and engaging with your readers and other authors. In fact, I, I have some ideas on how you can do that. Some of you are probably already doing. Respond to a reader's questions. Ask for reader testimonials. Respond to reader compliments and feedback. How many times when somebody gives you a compliment have you said thank you? I think that's important. Um, ask questions to prospective readers that you find. Tweet links to your website, blog posts, and book bubbles. Share content with your Google Plus circles and maybe consider leading a Google Plus Hangout. Maybe you could do a, a Twitter chat. So a Twitter chat is at a set time of day that you say, hey, we're going to talk about this topic, and, and you gather people together, really build it up, and everybody talks. It's pretty interesting. Like and follow other author brands. You've heard me say this one before, guest posts on notable author blogs. You know, they don't have time to write content as much as, as they would like to, and they're hungry for content. So it's not that hard to get someone to say, yes, you can blog for me. And eventually you'll get to a point where you'll be having people approach you. Comment on leading author blog posts. Ask followers to link to your website. Respond quickly to posts. Now that one I have a hard time with sometimes, especially when I'm buried with different projects and work. But set aside a time where you're going to go in and that's going to be the time that you respond to, to posts. And introduce yourself to influential authors on Twitter. Now those are just a few ideas to get you started. Let's start, um, touch base on the next point. I have here write snappy sound bites. How do you do that? My friend and writer friend, um, Ann Wiley, she puts it this way. Follow the one, two, three rule. For quotes, one sentence is great. Two are okay, and three are too many. So when you're sharing something socially or even writing a paragraph, keep it short and snappy. Cut through the clutter. Again, we're in a society of soundbite journalism. People scan. You know that they do because you do it. They don't read lengthy prose online. So to increase comprehension, keep your sentences to 14 words on average. Partner with influencers. Now, I touched on this earlier, but this is a great way to connect with readers by connecting with other influential authors. They already have a great following of readers, and by interacting socially with that author, you're sure to build a new relationship, generate attention, and eventually add new followers. Most importantly, you need to be consistent. I know, I know, I've said that before, but I can't say it enough. The number one key to successfully building your top of mind awareness is to consistently market your brand and interact with other readers and authors. So Orna, do we have any other questions? We have a question about consistent, actually. Um, what is consistent? Once a day, once a week, twice a day? You know, I've seen a lot of different studies on that. And I'll tell you what um, I've been following as of late is I actually try to have at least three to five uh, tweets um, posted a day. And you're thinking, well, how do you do that? I use something called Hootsuite. It's free. If you haven't heard of it, I, I suggest you check it out. And I can schedule things far in advance. So if I happen to have more than that, on, on Twitter, that's fine because Twitter is just a, a, a live, living, breathing machine that has constant conversation and thoughts going on. So that's okay. Um, on, on LinkedIn, I really sometimes suggest that you stick to one post a day, maybe even cut it back to one every other day. Um, it just depends on what you're trying to achieve and who you're trying to connect with. But people don't go through the information as quickly as they do on, say, Twitter. 
And on Facebook, um, it really depends. You know, I use Facebook just for personal use. And then, of course, I have the, the published brand entity that we do. Um, and on that one, I would say that you could have, you know, again, three to five pieces of content a day as well. People hit that at different times of the day. So you want to make sure that the information that they see is, is um, uh, relevant to them. Okay. Uh, I, I think this is kind of connected in a way. You, you mentioned hanging out and engaging. And do you literally mean by that just turning up and seeing what happens? Um, or, I mean, everything you're talking about here is a very directed approach. Is, is it always like that? Do you always go on knowing exactly what you want to do and then get off again as quickly as you can? Do you, what do you think about just hanging out online, which is something I know a lot of you do? You know, I think we are all hanging out where a lot of us are voyeurs <laughs> and we need to stop being a voyeur and join in the conversation. Um, I typically have my Hootsuite up and running in the background or my Twitter, um, whichever I'm following at that moment. And I actually will uh, take a break when I'm working on something and I will dock in. I also, and see what's happening and see what's important to engage with. Um, if I can. And then I also have alerts that are set up on my smartphone and my iPad that will tell me when somebody has engaged with me. Um, that way I can stop if it's important and I can actually engage with them right then. Um, I know in preparation for today's um, webinar, I actually was very focused and I shut everything off. And it was funny because I kept glancing out of the corner of my eye and my phone was exploding with all this Twitter activity that was going on surrounding the conference, mm -hmm. but I didn't have time to deal with it. Right. So you have to do, you know, realize that it's important, but also you have to set realistic priorities for yourself. Yes. Because coming back to this question again, which is earlier in here, um, two different mindsets are needed in a way um, because it's fine, you know, for you it's work and it's all kind of work and it's all in that marketing kind of mindset. But in order to write, say, fiction or, you know, to go deep into a character or whatever, you've got to get into a very different kind of mindset. Um, any tips on kind of switching from one t to the other? I, again, what I would do is I would schedule a time that you are going to do that during the day. And, and once you get used to having that time set aside, it'll become routine and you, you may not have to schedule it anymore. But when you're writing, stay focused on writing. Some people say that their best writing time is in the morning. Some say it's in the afternoon when the children are taking a nap. It just depends on who you are and what your life is about. But outside of that, maybe it's before you dive into writing or maybe it's right when you get done I Spend can offer time. sorry go ahead no go right ahead. no I can offer a, a little here myself just through the challenge of, of trying to do it which is that you know I definitely do recognize that it is a different mindset and that um, me personally what I do is I always write um, whatever is the most difficult and most challenging writing that I'm doing which is usually the novel um, or a poem or something like that first thing in the morning while sleeping mind is still um, elevated and meditation and yoga and um, listening to certain kinds of music are also practices that I think we all need to get used to and I think, Joy, without going across in any way what you're saying, because I, I do completely recognize that what you're talking about is a vital part of being an entrepreneur in this day and age, you also need to know when to switch off. And I'm sure you'd agree with that, too. You do. And, and I have to confess that, you know, as a type A driven personality, I have a hard time switching off. <laughs> yeah. And that's actually something that I've been working on. Um, and as you were talking, Orna, I'll tell you a secret. Of course, it won't be a secret anymore now that I say it. But <laughs> I find that I do a lot of my interacting on social media when I when I propped up on the couch and I've got the mindless TV going on. In the yeah. Back. That seems to work really well. I don't think you're alone in that. It, it definitely helps, yeah, to, to do it. Also, I think to, to think of it as, as a conscious switch off from the other, you know, that each of them can complement each other very well if you don't see them as anti antagonistic to each other. Yeah. It's the mindset thing again. Okay, time is running along. Um, can we proceed or? Sure. So let's say that you're doing all the things that we've talked about. 
And how do you ensure your success? And you've heard me talk about this, but let's unpack it a little bit deeper. You need to create measurable goals. The best approach is to select one measurable brand awareness goal that you want to focus on. And then whatever goal you choose, make sure that it's quantifiable and has a set time frame for accomplishment. Um, in one of my other webinars, you'll hear me talk about setting SMART goals. And SMART is actually an acronym. Um, that stands for strategic, measurable, actionable, S-M-A-R, um, reasonable or realistic, right? And then time bound or a timeline, something that you can do within a certain amount of time. So for instance, um, I'm going to uh, send out, and I'm making this up so it may not be very good, <laughs> but um, I'm going to send out... Uh, a blog post every other week for the next quarter. Um, I'm going to uh, spend 30 minutes uh, scheduling my tweets uh, once a week on Friday for the next month. And again, they, they could be more polished than that. Those are totally off the cuff, but I think you get the idea. Um, so make sure that you focus on just a few things. Probably the only thing worse than doing nothing is trying to do too much. Don't try to achieve everything at once. You've heard the saying, jack of all trades, master of none. Well, if marketing isn't your first love, which clearly I'm probably an anomaly here, it's mine, um, <laughs> then you want to focus on a handful of goals and successfully execute them before adding more into the mix. Remember that trying to measure direct conversions to sales is usually not a good metric for measuring brand awareness or top of mind awareness. By definition, top of mind awareness is only the first stage in the buying process. And then you want to keep your drumbeat going. The premise of top of mind awareness and brand building is to get your foot in the door with the prospective reader so that you can close the sale when they're ready to buy. That said, your bottom line is to keep that drumbeat going consistently. And I mentioned this before, but you can easily use free scheduling tools such as Hootsuite to schedule outreach when you're busy. And you can also get ahead of the game and write tweets and posts that you'll use a month later. Set realistic expectations. Now, to do this, you want um, long-term success, right? So you need to be persistent, and you need to be patient. And I have to tell you, I have the persistent thing down, but the patient stuff I'm working on. And I, I venture to guess you guys are the same way, right? So build awareness for your author brand simply takes time. It's not something that can be fast-tracked. Just as your reputation cannot be built from scratch overnight, neither can brand awareness. What you should realistically be looking for is a cumulative increase in brand awareness over time. So how do we measure success? Well, consider creating online surveys. You heard me mention surveys earlier. There are many services out there that will help you quickly and easily set up a survey, and some of them are free and some of them charge a fee. I used to use SurveyMonkey a lot, but I found that I have more flexibility with something called Survey Act, and it's free. So I recommend that. When you write a survey for any audience, you always want to keep it short and sweet. I recommend um, to keep it between five to ten questions, no more than that. To get a good response rate, set a deadline for responding to the survey. And consider en entering respondents into a drawing for a prize. That'll be the incentive, right? If you can swing it, an Amazon gift card seems to be a huge draw. And maybe they'll spend it on buying a book from you. When you formulate your questions, you need to know that there are two types of brand awareness questions. There's aided and unaided. Aided questions are when you provide a list of responses and ask them to choose. Whereas unaided is free form and you don't provide any prompts and, and that's really top of mind awareness measurement. So an example of an unaided question might be when you think of romance authors who comes to mind? And you may have three to five write-in boxes to, for them to provide their answers. Or when you're looking for a book to read, what genres do you find yourself drawn to the most? Again, give them three to five write-in boxes. 
you can see how without providing an answer, you're truly learning what is top of mind for them for a particular category. Now, I have to rip the Band-Aid off. The results you get may be painful because you're not in them. But it's going to help you grasp where you rank, who your competitors are, and then how to evaluate how to make changes in your plan for building more top of mind awareness. And you may want to build the survey and then repeat it over time to see how things have changed after you've tweaked your plan and implemented it for a while. Another way to measure top of mind awareness is by measuring your social interactions. You want to look at numbers, your metrics, and you're going to want to focus on classic things like measuring reach and frequency which measures how well we, air quotes here, shout at our readers. We're talking at them, right? And then we want to focus on measuring your share of voice, the buzz you build, the sentiment. Are they happy? Do they like it? And the social sharing. So, you know, did they share it with others? Do they like it? Did they forward it? Here's some key terms with definitions to help you understand what to look for. So, for instance, Facebook metrics. People talking about this. The number of unique people who have created a story about your page. Or how about user men mentions? The number of times that a user tags your page in their post. This is when you can see the link directly to your page from the post or comment. Or total reach. Now, these terms are familiar to me and probably not to you, but it's the number of people who could have seen your story about your page. This is counted for um, each person who loads a story about your page while browsing Facebook. If you look at Twitter, there's things like total impressions and mentions and replies and retweets. Some of these you know. You know what a retweet is. It's when somebody shares, retweets what you just shared, right? Um, or maybe it's engagement per tweet, the total number of replies and retweets to one of yours. If all of this is more than you want to know, you can look for a service that will monitor that information for you. In fact, shameless plug here, but <laughs> there's a few ways to ag aggregate all the data from all the various social media platforms. And unfortunately, Publish provides aggregate metrics as a service to all subscribing entrepreneurs. It's pretty cool to be able to look on your entrepreneur dashboard and see which posts and tweets um, were the most effective and which ones led to click-throughs on your buy links. There is a free 30-day free trial, so you may want to check that out. Anyway, this is just a taste of ways to measure your TOMA, your top of mind awareness. So in closing, I want you to remember that creating top of mind awareness is in your hands. You have the power to be successful. It's just a matter of creating the time to thoughtfully plan and then consistently act upon your plan. So thanks, Orna. I'll pass it back to you. Yeah, thank you so much indeed. Um, fantastic uh, presentation, Joy. Um, yeah, we are all out of time, I'm afraid. We have loads of questions. I'd like to suggest that this should continue perhaps in the comments box below um, if people want to leave their questions either on the blog post or on the Google Hangout that you'll be able to come back over the next you know, week or two consistently to um, answer some questions. Would that be okay? Yeah, that sounds great. And if you look at the screen um, right now, I have my contact information up as well. Um, you can reach me at joy at bubblish or at um, scuba joy. And if I could add um, one last thought, Orna, I wanted to, to do another shameless plug. This Friday, April 17th at 2.30 p.m. Eastern Time, you won't want to miss out. Um, Kathy Mice, who is the founder and CEO and president of Bublish, is going to be presenting a webinar called Planning Successful Social Media Campaigns. And um, she's a really dynamic speaker, so you won't want to miss that. And uh, Kathy is absolutely fantastic, um, and, and that will be a real treat. It's not a shameless plug at all. It's a, you're passing on some great information there. And um, also, just to say that you guys have very kindly, uh, Bublish is a silver sponsor of Indie Recon. Now, our sponsors are just so important to the success of Indie Recon. It's because of people like Bublish who have so generously contributed that we are able to keep this event free for authors all over the world. So thank you, Joy. And 
On top of that, these guys are giving away a year's premier membership of Bubblish, which brings with it all sorts of wonders. And if you don't know what a book bubble is, I uh, encourage you to hasten on over to Bubblish.com and find out. And uh, do enter the competition because a year of Bubblish behind your book is something that will make your book very happy indeed. So thank you, Joy, um, so much. A fantastic presentation, loads there. And um, I learned a ton myself myself and uh, look forward to applying some of this in the near future. Thank you. Thank you. And see you again soon. Bye everyone. Thanks Bye. for being here. And next up we have Jane Friedman. And Jane's um, topic will actually build on what Joy has been talking about here because Jane is going to be talking about content marketing. So see you shortly for that. Bye-bye.